Okay, so here's the video uh, going through the study guide. So, the first part says do problems 1, 2, 4, 9, and 11. So, the first one is talking about functions and function notations. And the idea here is functions are relationships where for each x value there's only one y value. So, looking here at problem 1, you see I have different x values. I don't have any repeat of x values. So for each x value, a, b, and c, there's a y value, b, d. Well, there's two, two y values, but that's okay. You can have the same y value um, for different x values. You just can't have the same x value for different y values. So if I had c here and c there, <clears throat> and then two different y values, then I would not have a function, but in this case I do have a function. So for each x there is one y, but the y value can be repeated. So the second one is an example of where it is not a function, and that's because we have these four coordinate pairs, and you can see I'm repeating the x value with two different y values. So look for repeats in the x place, in the x location, and then with different values in the y location. Okay, number four, it says, is the graph in figure one a function? So here's the graph. And so one way of doing this is looking at a vertical line test. So if I were to draw vertical lines, you would see that this curve would only be intersected at one location for each vertical line. So this is a function. This is a quadratic function of some kind. Okay, the next problem is 9 through 11, so let's go there. So these are asking, again, to use the vertical line test. So let's, um, let's just grab those and show you how to do the vertical line test. And we'll put it into the smart board software so we can write something. Okay, so that they are. So all we have to do is take our pencil and draw a vertical line. And I'm going to draw one line and then I'm going to use this just to kind of move it. So you can see no matter where I go here, this only intersects the function, this relationship, one y value for each x value. Now if you go to number 10, you can see here that for this given y x value of 2, there's actually two y values in any point that is to the right of x equals 1 has two values of y, but it only has to be one. You only have to have that happen one time for it to not be a function. Now here, you can see I'm intersecting this blue line and it intersects this upper blue line until we get to x equals 0. Then you have a vertical asymptote and then you start intersecting the second blue line only in one location. So this is a function. And this is not a function. And this is a function. So that's what you're going to have to do. Either have a table, like we did here, and look for the case of repeating x values with a different y value. If that's the case, then it's not a function. If you have repeating y values but different x values, then that's OK. That, that is a function. Okay, next thing is evaluating functions, so it's problem number five. So it says, for the ex following exercise, evaluate the functions at the indicated values of f. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and grab that expression and the values that we're, being eva we're, that we're trying to evaluate. So all you have to do is substitute in for x in the function the values over here. So f of negative 3 
is negative 2 times negative 3 quantity squared plus 3 times negative 3. And we evaluate that. Negative 3 squared is positive 9. And here, positive 3 times negative 3 is negative 9. So we get negative 18 minus 9, which is negative 27. Okay, f of 2 is negative 2 times 2 squared plus 3 times 2. 2 squared is 4, so we get negative 2 times 4 plus 6. So that's negative 8 plus 6, which is negative 2. Then we have f of negative a. So here, you know, we're, we're substituting a variable in. And so negative a gets substituted in. Instead of a number, it's a letter. And then we clean things up. So negative a squared is is positive a squared. So the negatives cancel out here. Here you get 3 times negative a, so that's negative 3a. And then finally we can get rid of the parentheses, so you get negative 2a squared minus 3a. That's f of negative a. Now if we do f of negative f of a, so Let's just write what f of a is. A, f of a is just like f of x, except you've substituted a in. So it would be negative 2 a squared plus 3a. And when I take the negative of that function, then I change the sign of each term. I negate each term. So the negative 2 becomes positive 2. And the positive 3 becomes negative 3. So that's the answer there. You can see that f of negative a is not the same as f negative f of a. Then we have this a plus h, which is associated with the difference quotient. And you will be required to know how to do that. So I may show you how to do that in this case. This is showing f of a plus h, but the difference quotient is a little bit further step. So f of a plus h, again, you plug in a plus h in for x. And you'll see they're all the same form. Negative 2 times this stuff in the parentheses, negative 2 times this stuff in the parentheses squared. OK, now to, to do this difference qu quotient, you have to multiply everything out. So when you square a plus h squared, you get a squared, squared, doubled, squared. So I've got a squared plus 2ah plus h squared plus 3 times a plus h. And then I <clears throat> multiply everything out, get rid of the parentheses, so I'll get negative 2 a squared, negative 2 times two, positive 2 is negative 4, so I get negative 4 a h. Then I get negative 2 so I get negative 2 h squared and then the 3 distributed is 3 a plus 3 h. So that's f of a plus h. Now if I wanted to do the difference quotient I'd have f of a plus h minus f of a. The h is the thing I'm adding on, divided by h. So you see I have f of a plus h. It's going to be negative 2a squared minus 4ah minus 2h squared plus 3a plus 3h. So that whole thing is f of a plus h. And then I do f of a, which I didn't do directly, but I, I use that as part of this one. So you substitute uh, a for x. So you get negative 2a squared 
plus 3a. So this just involves a. And remember, you, sub you subtract it. And we're going to divide the whole thing by h. And let's go ahead and remove the parentheses from the first five terms, minus 2a squared minus 4ah minus 2h squared plus 3a plus 3h and then distribute the negative sign so the negative 2a squared becomes plus 2a squared and the positive 3a becomes negative 3a you divide the whole thing by h now what always happens in these different quotients is that the the terms that just involve a cancel out. So negative 2a squared cancels out with positive 2a squared. This one has h, this one has h, this one has just a, so neg 3a, and then we subtract 3a, so let's go to 0. So what we're left with is the terms that have at least one h involved. Sometimes we have squareds. So the ones that, because what we're trying to do is to divide this h out. So these ones that don't involve h have to cancel out or we're going to be in trouble. So then you divide each one of these terms by h. So you get negative 4a minus 2h plus 3. Because this h cancels out with it, that h. Now, what you're really doing here, I've kind of left a step out. I could put another step in. What you end up with is negative 4a over h minus 2h squared over h plus 3h over h. So this h, you have to divide every term by h. So that cancels out with that. This cancels out with one of the h's there. and These cancel out. So you end up with negative 4a minus 2h plus 3. So that's how a difference uh, quotient works. Okay, moving on here, range and domain. So that's 20 through 22. So we got these three, and the, th the things you have to think about are square root functions. The argument has to be greater than or equal to zero, and also the denominator. Um, if the denominator goes to zero at a particular value of x, then the domain doesn't include that. So I'm going to take these, I'm going to copy them over to my smart board. I'm going to do each one separately so I have a little more room. So it's asking for both the domain, or it's just asking for the domain. The range is probably all real numbers. Okay, so anytime you have one of these things called rational functions, then you have to worry about where does the function go to zero. And somehow I missed one of those. What happened? Okay, let me go back here. Okay. Now, there's no square root, so we don't have to worry about that. The only thing we have to figure out here relative to the domain is where does the denominator go to zero? So we set the denominator equal to zero, and then we solve for x. So I'm going to subtract 2 from both sides, and then I'm going to divide both sides by 3, so I get negative 2 thirds. So this is the only value of x which is not in the domain. So you can kind of think of it as, you know, here's 0, here's negative 2 thirds, here's negative infinity, like out there, positive infinity right there. So we need to go from negative infinity to negative 2 thirds. We don't include it, so we put a rounded parenthesis. We put a union, 
because this is going to include all of these points except negative two-thirds. So we do again negative two-thirds, so it's not including negative two-thirds, but it's going from there on the other side to positive infinity. That's the only value of x where this function does not exist. So the domain, you could say the domain is all real numbers except x equals negative two-thirds, but this problem asks you to do it in interval notation. Now here, if we have a something other than just a linear term in the denominator, we're going to factor that. What are the values of x that cause this quadratic to go to zero, which is either going to be two or zero. In this case, it's going to be two, I believe. So you're going to factor it. And so if we factor it, you're going to have x here, and you're going to have x there. And two numbers that are multiplied by 12, whose difference is 4. Well, if you thought 3 and 4, 3 times 4 is 12, but the difference is 1, so that's not going to work. Uh, the other two are 6 times 2. So the difference between 6 and 2 is 4. Okay, that sounds like it ought to be right. So I'll put 6 and 2. And now one's going to be positive and one's going to be negative because we have a negative 12. So we're going to have a positive 6 times a negative 2 or the other way around. Now because we have the middle term is negative, you're going to put the negative in front of the larger of these two numbers that are multiplied to give, it, to give you 12. So this one's going to be negative. This will be positive. So the answer, the product will be 0 if this is 0 or this is 0. So then you solve for x. So you get x is 6 and x equals negative 2. So I can, I can rewrite this original function as x minus 3 over x minus 6 and x plus 2. Now the numerator has nothing to do with the domain. It would have to do with intercepts, but we'll talk about that when we get to it later. So all we have to do is, is again, write this domain out. We could do it as a number line to get started. So we're going to have a 0 here, and we're going to have positive 6, and we're going to have negative 2. Those are the values of x, which cause this to go to, to the denominator to go to 0. So you're going to have all of this to there, and then a little curved thing, and then you have a curved parenthesis from there to 6, and then another curved parenthesis going all the way out to positive infinity. This goes to negative infinity. So in uh, interval notation, you're going to have negative infinity to negative 2 in union with negative 2 to 6 in union with 6 to infinite, positive infinity. So this basically says all real numbers except x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 6. Now the next one is a little more complicated because you've got two things happening here. We know that the square root of something has to be positive. So we know that the square we need to we know that x minus 6 has to be greater than or equal to 0. Um, from the denominator, we know that x has x minus 4 has to be greater than or equal to 0. And we also know that x cannot equal 4. Because if you plug 4 in here, you'll get 0. So this, this one applies to the denominator going to 0. This one applies to the square root argument of the square root being positive. So this says x has to be greater than or equal to 6. This one says x has to be greater than or equal to 4. This says x cannot equal 4. So let's draw a number line here with all these things on here. So you can have 0, you can have 4, 
and 6. So here, x has to be greater than 6. So that's, that's that first one. The second one says x has to be greater than 4. So that's just going to build on this one. And um, But x cannot equal 4. So we're going to put a curved parenthesis. So our domain in this case is that um, x is going to be from 4 to positive infinity, but not including 4, because if x equals 4, then, uh, then the denominator would go to 0. Now let's, let's just look at what would happen if we switched the numerator and the denominator. Like that. So what would happen here is the numerator is saying that x minus 4 has to be greater than 0. The denominator says x minus 6 has to be greater than 0. And the denominator says that x cannot equal 6. So what I've done is you can see I've switched these things. So again, this is because this, has, this argument has to be positive. This one has to be positive as well. So you get x is greater than or equal to 4. We saw for x, x has to be greater than or equal to 6, but x cannot equal 6. So if I draw this on a number line again, still got the same numbers. The first one says x um, has to be greater than 4. But the next one says x has to be greater than 6. So this, this one doesn't really apply. Is that true? Yeah, because if I put four, if I plug four in here, I'll get negative two, so it can't be four. Um, so, you know, the, I can't have any number between four and six, even though it works in the uh, works in the denominator, it doesn't work on the numerator, and I can't let x equal six, so it's going to be this is going to be the result. So in this case, the domain of this one would be that x, well, x has to be greater than 6. So it's going to be curve bracket 6, comma, positive infinity. OK, moving on here. Average rate of change. So the average rate of change is just the value of the function at the end of the interval minus the value of the function at the beginning of the interval divided by the length of the interval. So let's just take a picture of these. and uh, Yeah, I'm just going to do them all at once, different times here. And what we're doing is we're finding the slope between the beginning and end point. And that slope of that line is the average rate of change. OK. So all of these are from x equals 1 to x equals 2, if I remember correctly. So x, we'll call x1 equals to 1, and x2 equal to 2. And it's, it's 1 because it's not because of this subscript. It's because, because it's the, the interval. You know, we're going from 1 to 2. So we're doing this interval, including the endpoints. So you do f of x1, which is f of 1. So we plug 1 into the function. So we'll get 1. So f of 1 is f of 1 is 1. Uh, and then we do uh, f of x2, which is f of 2. So we get 4 times 2 minus 3, which is going to be uh, 8 minus 3, which is 5. So the average rate of 
change is equal to f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by x2 minus x1. So we just plug it in now. f of x2 is 5, f of x1 is 1, x2 is 2, x1 is 1. So you get 4 divided by 1, which is 4. So the average rate of change is 4 for that first problem. And if I were to plot these two points, the slope between those two points would be 4. OK. Same thing here. We do f of x1. Again, x1 is equal to 1. x2 is equal to 2. So f of x1 is, that's f of 1. So that's 10 times 1 squared plus 1, which is 10 times 1 plus 1 is 11. So that's f of x1. f of x2 is f of 2. So that's 10 times 2 squared plus 2. And that's 10 times 4. That's 40 plus 2 is 42. So the average rate change is f of x2, which is 42, minus f of x1, which is 11, divided by f of 2, f, or x2 minus x1, so that you get uh, 42 minus 11, which is 31 over 1, which is 31. So that's a much higher average rate of change. Then the last one is this. Now this is a reciprocal function, so I think it's going to have a negative rate of change. So again, x1 equals 1, x2 equals 2. So we do f of x1, which is f of 1, which is negative 2 over 1 squared, which is negative 2. And then we do f of x2, which is f, I don't need that subscript up here, so let me get rid of that, uh, f of 2. So that's negative 2 over 2 squared, which is negative 1 half. 2 divided by 4 is a half. Okay, so the average rate of change, remember it's f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by x2 minus x1, so that's negative 1 half minus a negative 2 divided by 2 minus 1. I said it was negative, but it may not be, because this is, so not, it's not just 1 over x squared, it's 1 over negative 1 over x squared, so you get different behavior. So here you get negative 1 half plus 2 negative times a negative, divided by 2 minus 1, which is 1. So 2 minus a half is 1 and a half, or 3 halves. So this is 2 halves, 4 halves minus 1 half is 3 halves. And it's positive because this, this half is smaller than the 2, so you get that. So the answer is, every rate of change is 3 halves, so actually it's positive. Again, it's the slope of the line that goes between the beginning and end points. Okay, the next um, group is increasing and decreasing intervals. So we have these three problems. So we'll just, just make a copy of all three at one time. And it says, uh, determine the intervals. So we're going to use interval notation. OK, so what you see is it's decreasing. As we go from left to right, this value is getting less positive, more negative. Decreases to here, so that's x equals 2. 
So what we can say is that the interval from negative infinity to 2, it's decreasing. And then after 2, to positive infinity, it's increasing. At x equals 2, it's neither increasing nor decreasing. OK, now we have this. You can see this is kind of the boundary. So that's uh, x equals 2, or x equals negative 2, and y equals x equals 1. So from this part, we will start at negative infinity. Negative infinity to um, negative 2, it's decreasing from negative 2 to positive 1. It's increasing, and from 1 to positive infinity, it's decreasing. So decreasing, not either increasing, neither one decreasing. And this final one, um, it's constant. So when it's constant as a function of x, it's neither increasing nor decreasing. Here we just have one point, but here we have a lot of points. And we look at where that change occurs, which is negative 3 and 1. So for number 29, we'll say that between negative 3 and 1, these are the x values that the function is increasing because I go as I go from left to right, the value is becoming more positive. It's moving up the graph. There's no places where it's decreasing. And from negative infinity to negative 3, it's constant. And from positive 1 to infinity, it's constant. OK, next is, inter is um, extrema. And they're asking us to look at each one of these three problems. Well, first two are looking at these. And then the, the last one here, I think, the last two are associated with this graph. So let's just talk through these. So here there's, there's one local minimum, and it occurs right here. Let's go back to here so I can write it up. Let me go ahead and just make a copy of this thing. OK. So for number 20, number 30, it says use this graph. So the extrema, there's one extrema. And we have a local minimum. And we give both coordinates. So the, we give the x value, which is 1, 2, and the y value, which is looks like negative 2. You've got to be careful of the scale here. You can see they're in different in different directions, different in different directions. So it's actually negative 2, not negative 1. Uh, 31 is looking at this graph. You can see we've got a local minimum here and a local maximum there. So this is a min. This is a max. So we'll say local minimum is going to be here at x equals negative 2, y equals negative 3. And we have a local maximum. This other point here, which is going to be 1 x equals 1, y equals 3. So again, you, you don't just give the x value. You give the x and y value. And then the final problem is this one. Zoom in a little bit. OK, so it says the domain is from 
negative 3 to positive 3. So we're only looking in this part of the curve. And it says the range is from positive 10 to negative 10 to positive 10. So you can see here we have positive 10. Here we have negative 10. Find the absolute minimum of the function on this interval. So we go along, it's increasing. We're peak, that's a maximum. It's a, it's a hill. Then we come down to the valley. So it's right there. So the absolute minimum is going to be the x value and the y value. So it's positive 2, negative 10. Again, you have to look at the, the scaling on the graph. And this is find the absolute maximum. That's this point over here. And to be honest, it, it looks like it may not be exactly negative 2. But that's as close as we can get. So that is how you find the absolute value, absolute minimums and maximums. Okay, next thing we're talking about is uh, composite functions. So here, problems 35 and 36. So it's these two, and we're doing f of g of x and g of f of x. Okay, so we're doing, there's two ways of writing, remember, f of g of x, that's one way, or f of g of x. So we're going to look at the outside function, f of x. We're going to do 3 times something in parentheses plus 2. And that thing we stick in the parentheses is the g of x function. So it's 5 minus 6x. And then we just simplify it. 3 times 5 is 15. 3 times negative 6 is negative 18. So we get negative 18x plus 2. 15 plus 2 is 17. So we get 17 minus 18x. Now the other way around, which is g of f of x, which we also write as g of f of x. We take the g function, g of x, 5 minus 6. For x, we put parentheses. And we plug in f of x in there. So that's 2x plus 3. And now we simplify. So 5 negative 6 times 3 is negative 18, negative 6 times 2 is negative 12, and what we get is 5 minus 12, which is negative 7 minus 18x. So you can see that they're not the same thing. Um, so this is g of x, this really is g of f of x once I stick that f of x in for x. So I guess probably I should write this as, as g of f of x. And you can see what I've done is I put the parentheses to substitute f of x in here. Same way over here. So let's, let's be more exact about that. So this is f of g of x. So I first write the function f of x, but instead of putting x in there, I put in a parenthesis, leave space. Okay, let's look at the next one. So f of g of x. which is f g of x. So I take f of x, which is x squared, but I replace the x with the parentheses. So I have 
parentheses squared plus 2 times parentheses. So for parentheses, I put in g of x. And then I just got to clean it up. So I'm going to use um, 5x squared is 25x squared. So 5 squared is 25, x squared is x squared. Then you take 5x times 1, which is 5x, and you double it, so it's 10x. And then you add 1 squared, which is 1. So that's that multiplied out. Then you have 2 times 5, which is 10. So you get 10x, and 2 times 1, which is 2. So we can leave the first term the same because there's only one of those. We've got 10x plus 10x, which is 20x, and 1 plus 2, which is 3. So that's f of g of x. And then to do g of f of x, I'm going to take g of x and put a parenthesis where x is. And I'm going to substitute in f of x inside the parenthesis. So multiply that out, you get 5x squared plus 10x plus 1. 5 times x squared is 5x squared. 5 times 2x is 10x. And we're done. Okay, so that's g of f of x versus f of g of x. Okay, moving on here. So now we're going to do transformations. So here we are, transformation problems. So it says 45 to 50. So here we are. Sketch the graph of the given functions. So you kind of have to know what the parent functions look like. So what we'll do is we'll draw the parent function, and then we'll look at how you do the transformation. So let's get the clean piece of paper here. And I'm going to assume that uh, you have that worksheet that gives you the uh, parent function stuff. So I'll try to be consistent with that. So, so let, me, let me find that first. So it's called the toolkit. So assuming you have the toolkit to work with. So our first problem is x minus 3 squared. So we have uh, f of x, or y, equals x minus 3 squared. So uh, if you look at toolkit for a quadratic, which is what this is, because our parent function is going to, we'll call it g of x. That's just x squared. So you have 0, 0, and you have 1, uh, 1, 1, 2, 4, negative 1, 1, negative 2, 4. Okay, so there you have those four points. And we could draw a curve in, the, in there. All we're doing here is we're going to shift everything by some amount. And remember, if it's outside the parentheses, then that's the y direction shift. It's inside the parentheses, it's going to be the x shift. So looking at this equation, we say we have a y, uh, x shift, because you know, it's inside the parentheses, x shift of plus 3 because we have x minus. It's always the opposite of what's in there. So we're going to move everything three units in the x direction. So one, two, three. There's that point. This point goes one, two, three. This point goes one, two, three. This point goes one, two, three. And this point goes one, two, three. So all I'm doing is counting. And you can see I have this function. And just as long as I'm through these five points, I'll be OK. You know, this is my, my parent function. Okay, so that's the that's the first problem. So let's get another piece of scrap paper. Actually, I want to draw the function up here. So what do we got? 46 x plus 4 cubed. So we got y equals x plus 4 cubed. So our parent function is x 
cubed. So we look on our parent function sheet and we see, oh, there's the cubic function. So we need to plot 0, 0, uh, negative 1 half, negative 0.125. So it's really close here. Positive 1 half. I'm going to I'm going to change the x scale here. So this is from 5, negative 5 to positive 5. We'll do the same thing here. 5, negative 5. Okay. So uh, halves, this is going to be one unit. So we go negative 1 half, negative 0.125, negative 1, negative 1. And then we go positive 0.5 plus 0.125, and then positive 1, just here, here's positive 1 there. So, you know, this far, this part, we can kind of just say it goes fairly straight down this direction. So that's, that's the parent function. And again, we're going to shift it. And because the uh, thing is inside the parentheses, we end up with an x shift of minus 4. So we just take each one of these points and go four units. So one, two, three, four. So that's this point. This point we go four units. So that's going to go to here. This one goes four units. One, two, three, four. So that goes there. This one here goes four units. One, two, three, four. So that one goes here. And then this one goes four units. One, two, three. Four. And you know everything's these curves are exactly the same except they've just been shifted. So that's that one. Okay. Next problem, so we got 47. So we got a square root function, square root of x plus 5. y equals the square root of x plus 5. So the plus is outside the parentheses, which means y. So we need to draw our parent function. So we'll look on our, on our um, sheet, and it says square root. So we got three points, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 4, 2. So it kind of looks like that. So now we're going to shift all the points, all three points, five units upward. So this is shift, x, y shift, plus 5. So we take this point, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We're going to, you know, the scale here is negative 10 to positive 10, negative 10 to positive 10. You just have to look at the scale. It'll it'll be on your sheet. You won't have to decide what to do. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This one goes up 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This one goes up 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, so I've got three points again. And it's going to look just like that. Okay. So that was 47. 48 is negative x cubed. So we've already done x cubed. We did it as five from kind of an expanded scale just because of the choice they use. So we got zero, zero, a half, 0.125, one, one, negative a half, negative 0.125, negative one, one. So there's my parent function, something like that. Now what we're going to do here is we have uh, negative, I forgot the negative sign, so it's negative x cubed. So that's that's not negative x cubed, even though 
mathematically they turn out they're the same uh, because the negative is there is no parenthesis but uh, you assume that it's this is the same as negative of x quantity cubed so there's nothing in the parenthesis so there's no shift all we have is this reflection and because it's outside it's the it's an x-axis reflection so what happens is everything that's above the x-axis goes below the x-axis the same amount so this comes down from 0.125 to negative 0.125 this goes from positive 1 to negative 1 this goes from negative 0.125 to positive 0.125 and this one goes from negative 1 to positive 1 and so so it looks something like like that. Now you could say, well, that looks exactly like if I did it across the y-axis. And it, it's true. Because if I had negative x quantity cubed, that would be, in, that would be a um, y-axis reflection. But if I cube negative x, I'll get negative x cubed. So it just happens in this case. The y-axis reflection is the same result as an x-axis reflection in terms of what the graph looks like. Okay, next one, 49. So it's the uh, cube root, negative cube root. Or is it the cube root of a negative? What did I, I forgot what it said. Yeah, it's cube root of negative x. So y equals the cube root of negative x. So let's look at the, uh, the picture. So again, I'm going to go from negative 5 to positive 5. And we have things cubed or cube roots. It's more likely for something like this to happen. So these are increments of 1. Each grid line represents a half. So two grid lines represent a full. And this looks kind of like the x cubed thing, except it's flipped, kind of rotated around. So it, it'll be, um, so you go up here, 1 half, and then 0.125, and then you go up, up 1 and over 1. Let me go down 1 over 0.125, and over 1, down 1. And then it like this so that's my parent function for the cube cube root so what I've got here is a negative X so because it's inside that's going to be a y axis reflection so everything that's on one side of the y axis moves to the other side now the zero just stays where it is because it's already on the axis so you get that. So then the uh, transformation looks like that. And again, because it's this cube root thing, the y-axis reflection turns out to be the same as the x-axis reflection. And that's because uh, the reason that works out is because if you take three negative numbers and multiply them by themselves, you still have a negative number. Whereas if you square something, you have negative squared becomes positive, and positive squared becomes positive. So it's, a, it's kind of a difference there. Okay, and the last one here is 5 times the square root of negative x minus 4. So this one's kind of complicated. So you may not, we may not get it it exactly right but well, at least we can draw it relative to the parent function at least we if we at least get it that's it oh minus four okay so you're gonna have three things happening here we had a page so you can see it all. So you're going to have a uh, shift up, yep, up, shift down, sorry, it's negative four, shift down four because of the negative four. Um, 
actually only got two transformations unless that's a negative x. It might have been a negative x. Yeah, so it's a negative x right there. So that negative here means it's a y-axis reflection. And the 5 here, the 5 means, so it's, this negative x means an x y-axis reflection. The negative 4 means a shift down of 4. And the 5 is going to be a vertical stretch. So let's just think about what does what vertical stretch mean for a square root. The square root function looks something like that. So vertical stretch is, means you're going to pull it up kind of like that. And for every y value, the y value gets five times as large. So that's that's kind of the direction we're going this thing. Um, let's, let's put in our parent function. And let's make it go from negative five to positive five. I may regret that. But Okay, so you got you got zero zero. Here's ones. So you got zero zero one one and four two. So that's my parent function, like that. So let's do the uh, let's do the reflection first here. So we're reflecting across the y-axis. So that means this goes over here and this one goes over there. So that's the that's the y-axis reflection. Then I'm going to shift everything down four units. So let's hear these three points. Let's shift them down three. So one, one, two, three. So that point goes down to here. And we got one, two, three. That goes down to there. And this one goes one, two, three. So there we go. You can see how it's shifted down like that. Now, as far as the vertical stretch is concerned, what that means is it's going to go something kind of like this. Now, does this thing shift as well? Does this thing go further down? Uh, no, I don't think so, because you think about it, if x is 0, then you're going to have 0 times 5, which is 0. So it doesn't affect this anchor point. It seems like I didn't go far enough. Did I? 1, 2, 3. I only went 3 down. I should have gone one, one more down. Let's try to get, get rid of that point. So one, two, three, four. Should have gone down to four. One, two, three, four goes right there. And this one goes right there. So what's gonna happen is this thing's still gonna it's gonna get stretched out. And let's just double check it. So let's open up my graphing program if I can find it. Oh there it is. Okay. Okay, I think that's in the in the scheme of things. So what we're gonna do is do the square root of x. That's my parent function. We'll do square root of negative x. So that's my y-axis reflection. Then I'm going to do square root of negative x minus four. And then finally I'll do five times the square root of negative x minus 4. So here they are. So you can see here's the uh, y-axis reflection. Then we shift it four units downward. And then we stretch in the y direction. So you can see that's my final answer, which matches up pretty close with what I did. And there may be ones that difficult on the test, but most of them will be pretty straightforward. Okay, next one is 
given the graph, determine the equation. So that is 55, 56. So you have to recognize what the functions look like. But again, if you have the, if you have this parent function thing, you would see that this looks like the absolute value, and this one looks like a quadratic. Now we won't give you one stretch because that would be too difficult. So it's not going to be stretched, but it may be reflected. It may be shifted. So let's go ahead and grab two of those to figure out what's going on. Okay, so here they are. So one way is, is to plot the uh, parent function and then see what's going on. So I can go ahead and put the parent function on here, which is going to look exactly like this. This is the parent function for the, the um, reciprocal. So it's not quite right. My cursor is acting a little strange here, so try to figure out what's going on there. Okay, let me get rid of these little extra things that are sitting out here. So you can see it's an absolute value function. The only thing that I've switched is I've moved the x-axis. So if you think about the parent function, it's this. And the only thing that's different is that the x-coordinates have moved three units to the right. So it's going to be x minus 3. Now over here, if I plot the parent function, which is a quadratic, parent function starts at 0, goes 1, 1, 2, 4, 1 squared, 2 squared, negative 1 squared, negative 2 squared. So there you go. So you can see that this vertex, which is normally at the origin, is shifted 1, 2 units in the x direction and 1 unit in the y direction. So my parent function is y equals x squared, and my shifted function is going to be x something squared and then doing something here. So the y is you just do that directly. So the y is negative 1 because this vertex is shifted down 1. And then the vertex is shifted 2 units to the left. So then I add 2 into there. So that's how you do those. You just have to recognize the, the uh, parent function and then look at this usually where the function's turning. Here it's turning from one decreasing to increasing here, same thing, decreasing to increasing. Okay, the next problem set is about odd and even functions. So we've got 57 and 59. So let's just grab those. Now, you can't just look at the equation. I'm not sure if I grabbed that. You have to do the f of x versus f of negative x. I don't know why they got all those extra lines in there. It's weird. Oh well, you know what I'm talking about here. So what you do is you you evaluate f of x, which in this case is just 3x to the fourth, and then you do f of minus x. So we substitute for x, we put in negative x. So when you take a number a negative quantity to the fourth power, it becomes positive. If you have an even number of negatives involved in an exponent, then it becomes positive. If there's an odd number, it becomes negative. So this simplifies down to 3 times x to the fourth. So you can see that f of negative x is equal to f of x, and therefore it's even. Now, if I did something, you know, if I have 
um, something like this, f of x equals 2x cubed minus 2x. If I plugged in negative x, I get 2 times negative x cubed minus 2 times negative x. And when you cube ne negative x, you get negative x cubed. So this would become two, negative 2x cubed. So negative x times negative x is positive x squared. And then positive x squared times negative x is negative x cubed. Here we get positive 2x. So this is f of negative x. So you can see that f of negative x is negative f of x. Because here I've got 2x cubed minus 2x here. I've got negative 2x cubed plus 2x is so the difference. And therefore, it's odd. Now, one thing, if you had something like f of x equals 2x cubed plus 2x squared, you might say, well, this, this is cubed, so it's, it's odd. But it, that doesn't work out. You still have to evaluate it at negative x and see if they're the same. So you go 2 times negative x quantity cubed plus 2 times negative 2 squared. No, negative x squared. Sorry, negative x squared. So here, negative x cubed is is negative. The negative cubed becomes negative. And here you get negative x squared, which is positive x squared. So you get 2, two times, you get 2x squared. So finally, you'll get negative 2x cubed plus 2x squared. So f of negative x is not equal to f of x, and it's not equal to negative f of x. So you have to have you have to have odd exponents everywhere for it to be odd. So, but the best way to do it is to evaluate this. You already know what f of x is. Put a neg negative x into the equation. If they're equal to each other, if f of x equals negative f of, f of negative x, then it's even. If f of negative x equals negative f of x, then it's odd. So let's look at the second example here. So if I did h of negative x, I'd have negative 1 over negative x plus 3 times negative x. So you see this negative cancels out with that. So I get 1 over x minus 3x. Oh, this was positive, sorry. So that is negative. So 1 over x. If you plug in negative x for x, you get 1 over negative x, which is negative 1 over x. And uh, here, so what you can see is that h of negative x is equal to negative h of x. Here's h of x. This is negative. Each one of these changes sign. So this one is odd. And you know, another way you can think about it is this original function, this 1 over x can be rewritten as x to the minus 1 power. So 1 is odd and negative 1 is odd. So they're both odd. So that's why it works out that way. And let's, let's plot that function, 1 over x plus x, or 1 over x plus 3x, I guess it is. You know. So if I get rid of these, all these. So if I plot 1 over x plus 3x, see what that looks like. So there's the function. And you can see that f of negative x is negative x. You see how it's symmetric around, not across the x, the y-axis, but it's symmetric kind of across the origin. Now, if I change this to 3x squared, then 1's even and 1's odd, and now it's not going to be symmetric around the y-axis. OK, and then the final one is the uh, inverse 
functions. So that's 73, 74, 75, and 76. So let's look at those guys. 73 through 76. Okay. So this is find the inverse of this function. And uh, let's just grab this one. Yeah, man, that looks terrible. I have to figure out what's going on at some point, but not right now. Okay, so this first one's easy. And the next one is not so easy. Okay, so to do inverse functions, what you do is you replace f of x with y. Then you switch the x and the y on both sides. So the x on the left hand is uh, the, the x on the right hand side becomes y, and the y on the left hand side becomes x. Then you solve for y. So we'd subtract 9 from both sides. And then we divide both sides by 10. So you get x minus 9 over 10. Let's make sure we do it. And then you could say f inverse. The inverse function is, is the thing I solved for y. So we switch these two, subtract 9 from both sides, divide by 10. Yep, that sounds reasonable. And you can always check by plugging in, doing f of g of x, or f of inverse of x. Now over here, do the same thing. So you change f of x to y. Then we switch y becomes x and x becomes y. Now we've got to solve for solve for y. So the best thing to do would be to uh, just make that into a fraction and cross multiply here. So you'd have x times y plus 2 is equal to y. So then you multiply it out. xy plus 2x equals y. And you move all the terms involving y to the other side. So you get 2x is equal to y minus xy. And then you'd factor out the y. So what that leaves there is 1. Y, this divided by y is 1. And this divided by y is x. And then you divide both sides by 1 minus x. So you get 2 over 1 minus x. So that's your answer. So the inverse function, f inverse, is 2x over 1 minus x. So it's just a little more difficult. Algebra procedure is the same. Place f of x with y, switch y and x, solve for the y in the switched equation. Once you solve for y, place y with f inverse. Okay, the next one says, what does the next one say? It says, for the following exercise, find a domain on which the function f is 1 to 1 and non-decreasing which means increasing or zero. Write the domain in interval notation, then find the inverse of f restricted to that domain. OK. So if you look at this function, it's a quadratic function that's been shifted one unit in the y direction. So uh, here it's decreasing. And then at zero, it starts to increase. So what we want to do is get rid of that part. 
So the domain is x has to be greater than or equal to 0, or we could show it in interval notation as 0. Now we'd use a square bracket because it can't equal 0. So we'd say uh, 0, comma positive infinity. So that would be our, our domain. And that'll be the domain for the, for the inverse function as well. Or does that become the range? Yeah, that's the question. So let's see what it says again. For the following exercise, find a domain in which the function is one-to-one -one and non-decreasing. Then write the domain in interval notation. Find the inverse of f restricted to that domain. Okay. So, um, so we take the original function, place f of x with y, then we switch x is equal to y squared plus 1. So y equals x squared plus 1. Uh, subtract 1 both from both sides, take the square root, so we get y is equal to plus or minus the square root of x minus 1. So that's the inverse function, but what we're going to do here is um, this is the part of the curve that we want, which is the positive square root side. So that's how we do it, instead of, uh, and that always happens with these quadratic equations. So if you have, there's this positive side, which is the more positive y, and then this negative side, which is the more negative, sorry, more negative x. So you have to choose between the two. So that is the inverse function for this original function. If you took you know, plus would be one function, minus would be the other function, if you were to plot those. If you think about what's going on here, it's it's um, a square root term that's been shifted one unit to the, to the positive x. So it looks something like that. The negative square root, but it would be down here. This is a positive square root. And then the final one here, given f of x equals x cubed minus 5 and g of x is the cube root of x plus 5, find f of g of x and g of f of x. So there's two ways, there's a couple of ways of finding, well, confirming that something is an inverse. One is to plot it and look for a certain symmetry. The second one is to do this composite function. So if we do f of g of x, we take the f of x function, put a parenthesis where x is, so we get the qu quantity something cubed minus 5, and we substitute in g of x, which is the cube root of x plus 5. But the cube root cubed is just the argument of the cube root, so, they, so that becomes just x plus 5 cube root of something cubed is just the th something. And then you subtract your 5, and you can see the 5's cancel out, and you end up with x. Now if we do the same thing, g of f of x, there we take the cube root of something plus 5. Something is x when it's g of x, but this is, we plug in f of x, which is x cubed minus 5. Well, you can see the fives cancel out inside here now, and we end up with the cube root of x cubed. Well, the cube root of x cubed is also x. So because f of x, f of g of x, and g of f of x are both equal to x, then the functions are inverses. So since both f of g of x and g of f of x are x. The 
functions are inverses. Okay, so you can see there's um, some practice test problems as well that you can look at. I'm not going to do the solutions for those. I'm going to let you work those through, but uh, hopefully that helped you.